there may be uh, one or two <clears throat> individuals here um, for the first time. And if so, we want to extend a very warm welcome to such persons. And after the scheduled portion of the meeting is over, if you have any questions whatsoever on any aspect of Swami teachings or what we do in the Sai organization, please feel free to ask any of us and we'll be more than happy to tell you part, part of what we know at least wouldn't subject you to all of what we know. Okay, thanks, dear. Yeah, I'll for you. But again, for the visitors who have come here, I should tell perhaps one first experience in order to say very firmly what my viewpoint is about Satya Sai Baba. My uh, firm viewpoint after having met him in January of 1968, ever from that first moment of meeting him, I am convinced absolutely that he is a divine, a divine manifestation, manifestation and body of the Lord of the Almighty Lord. And I'll tell you the experience that impressed that so firmly in my mind that nothing, nothing has been able to shake it. My wife and I had been traveling here in the world, here and there, Europe, Asia, and so forth, attending um, various uh, well-known gurus. At the time we, had, uh, we first met Swami, that would be probably the eighth year that we had spent time in Burma, meditating in the Burmese pagodas on the Vipassana meditation. And uh, Indra Devi saw Swami and came back from there with the message that there exists a man in India who can change your life and your life will never change back again. So um, when I heard that from Mrs. Roger Gopal in Ojai, it uh, caught my imagination, and I uh, couldn't put it away. So I persuaded my wife to accompany me to India. She was reluctant because she doesn't care for India, and the previous year in uh, Gestad in Switzerland, where we had been to Krishnamurti's camp, G. Krishnamurti, coming out of a building, somebody had given her a shove, and she fell down and broke her foot. Well, Switzerland, where the broken bones are in every direction on those ski slopes, was supposed to have the very best uh, bone doctors. So one of them set her foot. And when we got back to the United States and went to our physician here, cast came off and the foot was twisted like that. And he told her, you're going to have to have a cane the rest of your life. And your foot's going to be like that for the rest of your life. Well, she didn't want to go to India, but when Indra Devi said that there's a man there who can change your life and never change back again, she thought, well, maybe uh, then he can change my foot to what it used to be. So she agreed to go. Now, when we first went there in January of 68, there were none of the new buildings that you see now when you go to Prasanthanilium. There were just some very old original buildings, uh, three or four or five sheds, and the original Mandir without the improvements that have been given to the Mandir in recent years. And coming from various parts of the world, there were about um, eight Westerners on the campus, and not more than 35 or 40 Indians. So that's the way it was at that time. So they put the ladies in the one shed and the men in the other shed. And then they told us, now go into the men's shed and sit there, and Swami is going to visit you. So we all went in and sat down, and our imaginations were running away with us, and our anticipations were boiling over. 
And certainly that was the case with me. And so then Swami came into the room. And all of our eyes were fixed on him. He was uh, so beautiful and so uh, delicate and so graceful. He would walk uh, back and forth uh, in front of us with the ultimate uh, grace in his movements. He seemed to just float across the floor rather than to walk. And he would look at us with his great big lustrous eyes and the beautiful big smile with his showing his teeth in a very friendly fashion, not, a, not another fashion. And sitting there and watching him, I uh, lost worldly consciousness and sunk uh, deep, deep into myself. I wasn't aware of the room or the people in the room. And I had been accused of having a dry Western heart because my pursuit of the truth had always been intellectual, on the intellectual side, something that I could understand and dig into. And so I had a dry Western heart. And then when I lost consciousness in the field of great quiet, I felt that in this dry western heart a subtle movement which had not been there before. And I thought, uh, that's the movement of love in my heart, although it felt just like the wind from a butterfly's wing, just very, very gentle. And after realizing, no, that's love moving in my heart, then I realized, no. That's such a saibatli in my heart. There he was in my heart as love. So then I came back out of that uh, deep feeling to Swami still walking there and talking to us. So I said to myself, who is it who could come uninvited into the heart of a stranger? And the answer came to me, who else could it be but God? Who else but God could come uninvited into the heart of a stranger and be there as love? So from that moment on, I knew from my own direct personal experience that Swami was God, was the Lord incarnate, and certainly I have never been budged from that position in the intervening years. Now, we stayed only, I think, eight days that time because we were on our way to Burma to continue our meditations in Burma. And um, Swami said to me, why do you go to Burma, Hislop? So I said, well, Swami, in Burma we can experience that the body is no more than a set of vibrations, no solidity to it at all. We said, well, yes, that's known every place. So at any rate, the following year, my guru in Burma, I had told him most enthusiastically about Satya Sai Baba, but um, he didn't view that in exactly the same way I did. And so he said, Hislop, you are banished for three years. Don't come back for three years. So, okay. And in that three year period, Ubakin died. So I never saw him again. And so from that time on, we were at Swami's ashram every year, usually twice a year, for many, many years. Now, why should anybody want to know about devotion? Why should they want to feel devotion? You see, everybody, no matter where he is or what class he belongs to, what gang he belongs to, what tribe he belongs to, everybody wants happiness. 
We want to be happy, and we want to live misery and despair behind. So, how can we get that happiness? All of us are trying desperately every day to find that happiness. That's the real goal that everybody has. But we look for that happiness in terms of worldly experiences and worldly possessions. Whereas there are a group of people in the world now, and there have been all throughout the past, people who have gone beyond that concept that happiness means happiness in the environment, happiness in the mind, happiness in the body. They went into very, very deep meditation and found that happiness means to put aside all illusion and delusion and to rest secure into, in that which one really is. And that which one really is, is God is the divine. So therefore, if we really want happiness, we have to step aside from the idea that we are going to find happiness in our everyday daily life. And we have to listen to these great sages and saints who say that happiness can be found only in the most intricate depths of one's own being, because at the very intimate depth of one's own being, there is the Atma, or God. That is, Swami says, there is something that withholds and withstands the entire universe, that which never moves, and that which never moves, and that upon which all relies, is I, myself, the Atma. Now, if we can regard ourselves with um, some interest and look at what has happened to our lives so far, and listen to what people from other lands and nations, ages tell us, that the happiness we are looking for is not going to be found in our daily life. That that happiness is going to be found only when we find our real, genuine, unchanging self, which is at the subtlest level of ourself. And that which is at the subtlest level of ourself is God, is the divine. They tell us that every individual in this world, no matter how miserable he may be in outward circumstances and in his actions, is divine, is blessed. Swami says, I love the greatest villain more than you do your dearest son, because he sees beneath that surface and knows that he himself is at the heart of that person. And he said furthermore that no matter how many times a person may stumble and fall and get covered with mud and muck on the highway of life, eventually he will rise again and he will survive and eventually he will return to the source from which he came, which is God himself. According to Swami and according to the great sages of India, that is the goal of every person in this world, every person in this room. One's real goal is not a million dollars, not a happy family life in this world. Our real goal is to return to the source from which we came. And that source from which we came is God himself. And we are not different than him. We know the familiar saying that uh, Swami uh, says all the time, yes, I am God, but so are you. The only difference being that I know it 
and you don't know it. When people quote Swami, they always stop at the first part. Yes, I am God. They say, ah, another crazy man, another God wandering around the world. They never repeat the second part. But so are you. The only difference between us is that I know it and you don't. And he says, you can know it. You can know it directly. There are very clear guidelines as to how one can manage his life in such a way that he will realize his godhood, that he will realize the atma, the imponderable atma, which is at the heart of the person. Now, if one is willing to accept that, and one may not be willing to. We look around the world and we say, oh, those poor people in uh, Bosnia, or those poor people in Russia, or in Africa, uh, they have no chance to learn a Swami. Uh, therefore, no chance to become free of misery forever and ever. Uh, that's not fair. But they lose sight of the fact that Swami said that no matter how many times a person may fall in the muck and the mud, he will get up again and he will proceed forward until he reaches that source from which he came. So all these people we feel so sorry for, we need not feel sorry. The out-breath goes from God and then comes the in-breath. They may be part of that out-breath. From them, for their sakes, from their viewpoint, what's the hurry? A million years from now, two million years from now, eventually they will come back to the source from which they came. But you and I, since we attend meetings like this, we are too impatient to wait two million years. We want something to happen now in this very life of ours. And so then, how can we develop devotion? Let me tell you what Swami, in his own words, what Swami says about devotion. He says, through devotion alone can wisdom be attained. Devotion purifies the heart, elevates the feelings, and universalizes the vision. Devotion has that power to bring the Lord down. The Lord, oh, he enters the heart of the devotees and resides there. That is the power of devotion has the absolute power to bring the Lord into our lives and to capture the Lord in our own hearts. Years and years ago, when we were there and I was, every place Swami would go in his car, he would take me with him. And uh, one time at uh, Prasanthi Nilayam, the college at Brindavan, they were having a tremendous the students, real big celebration. And they prayed and asked that the Swami come to Vrindavan and be at that celebration. And then Swami put me in a car and told me, uh, you go down to Vrindavan Hislop and you tell them that no, I will not come to their celebration. So I did. And then we turned to Vrindavan. And then the very next day, Swami called me and said, Hislop, get in the car, we're going to Brindavan. So I said, Swami, you said you wouldn't go. He said, yes, I know. But their devotion was so strong, I could not resist. So their devotion called him to go to Brindavan. And uh, one time, he called me in the car, and we were going for a ride. And he said, uh, Hislop, your devotion to me is so strong, I could not resist it. I had to take you in the car with me and go for a drive. So therefore, it is devotion that brings the Lord down, that brings the Lord into one's heart, that captures the Lord into one's life. Now, what is devotion? The previous speaker said it very nicely, didn't he? Every moment of the day, she is devoted to God. Every moment of the day, she thinks of God. That is the heart and soul of devotion. 
Devotion is day-long meditation, ceaseless meditation on God from the mo- time one wakens in the morning to the time one retires at night. Ceaseless, endless devotion to God. This lady has solved the problem. She is doing that. Every one of us can do that. Pardon the personal reference. I do it. I think of Swami as soon as I wake up in the morning. Every moment of the day, I'm thinking of Swami. If I have to do some work, I say, Swami, excuse me, I must do the work. Then immediately I come back to thinking of Swami. So since Swami says himself, that the quick road, the fastest road to union with God, the quickest road to realize one's unity with God, is devotion, day-long devotion. Then it is to that subject that we should address our minds and our attention, unless we want to play around and let another two or three million years pass. If you do, I sure don't. I can tell you, can tell you that. Now, How is it, how could it be that just day-long devotion to God, thinking of God all the time, will bring about union with him? See, Swami tells us most definitely that there is no real difference between him and us. He says, so are you, God. Difference being that I know it and you don't. The only thing that separates us from knowing that we are the divine, that we are one with God, is maya, illusion, delusion. What is illusion? What is delusion? Well, that beautiful shimmering sheet of water in the mirage in the burning desert That's illusion. It's not really there. It appears to be there, but it's not. So that's what illusion is in our life every day. We appear to be separate from God. We appear to be ordinary human beings, going about our work from day to day, our pleasures from day to day, doing what we please, and God is someplace else, and we are with the rest of the human beings. That's illusion. That's a dream. Swami tells us, without exception, that the sleeping dream is illusion. That is, in the sleeping dream, you meet people, you have adventures, you have troubles, you make friends, you make enemies, you see uh, historic buildings, you see giant new construction coming up, All those things are seen with absolute reality. And yet, the moment that you wake up, they disappear. And you don't even want to go back and see them. Because you realize automatically, as soon as you wake up, that all those things were just the creation of your mind. It was just your intelligence, clothing itself in mind stuff and projecting it as an outside dream world. Everybody knows that from the experience every single day. Swami tells us that this waking world is precisely the same. That all of these adventures and troubles and triumphs that we go through in the waking world are just a longer dream. When Swami told me that, I said, well, Swami, we see you working like the Dickens day and night in this waking world. If it's just a dream, why are you doing that? Swami said, Hislop, I come into your waking sleep to help you wake up. So that's what he's doing in our world, to help us wake up. And what does waking up mean? Waking up means realizing our identity with God, that there's only one, just God. He is God. I am God. No difference. Jesus said, I am the Son of God, I am the servant of God, my Father and I are one. 
ideas gave way to reality, and he realized <clears throat> that he and the Father were one. So then, how is this maya, which seems to separate God from us, how is that going to be put out of our lives? Swami says it's going to be put out of our lives by day-long, unceasing meditation on God. If we put our attention on Swami, hold our attention to Swami all the time, then the illusion that he is separate has to evaporate and disappear. Just as with the off-sighted uh, business of the snake on the path in India at dusk, it appears to be a snake. But you come back in the morning and you find it's simply a piece of rope. That is, the snake was an illusion. You ran away from it, believing in it. If you had stood your ground and stared and stared and stared and looked and looked and looked, then that illusion of the snake would disappear. The snake would have disappeared and you would see it's a rope. So in the same way, by fastening attention on God every moment of one's life, every moment of one's life, from the moment we awake until the moment we go to sleep, that constant glare, that constant attention, does away with, disperses the myth, disperses the illusion. And suddenly we realize that Swami and I are one. No difference between us whatsoever. So then, in daily life, how do we go about implementing that? How do we make that part of our regular daily life? It's not hard at all. Because the main thing that keeps us separate from God is our mind. Our mind weaves all of these histories of oneself and all of the things that are going on in the world. When does the mind do that? The mind starts to do that as soon as it stops working. If your mind is working at something, at your job, the work of the mind is planning and execution. That's the proper work of the mind. Planning and execution. Now, when you're involved in planning a project of your own, or in the office, and seeing to its execution, you're having no trouble. You're busy and quite content. But what happens as soon as that job comes to an end? Then your mind jumps all over the world starts its idling, its idle talk, its idle imagining, its idle imagination. And that's when you get into jealousy and anger and ambition and remorse and all of those things that create this screen between ourselves and the Lord. So, how can we, in the path of devotion, control the mind? Let me read again what Swami says. Spirituality means merger with God. Spirituality means merger with God. No need to undertake any other spiritual practice. You can forget all the meditations, forget all of your studies, and concentrate on merging with God. And you merge with God when the illusion that you are other than God disappears. And how can that illusion in daily life uh, be uh, put away? A number of very easy ways. And they mostly have to do with control of the mind. If you hope to enjoy spiritual life, if you hope to have spiritual life, have a glorious ending in union with the divine, you must put some work in on the mind. Now, you will notice that as soon as the mind has finished its work of planning and execution, it immediately jumps into random thinking. Oh, she said that to me. Oh, I don't like that. I should get a bigger salary. Confound it, my car has a flat tire, and so on and so forth. Runs all over the world in random thinking, which has nothing to do with your purpose of union with God. Nothing to do with merging with God. So then, how do you control this useless, harmless act, 
harmful activity of the mind moving all over the world. Swami says it's very simple. It's not hard. He said spiritual life is easy. It's worldly life that's hard. Very easy. What you do is to put the mind to work on thinking of God. One way is to recite God's name. If you take Sai as representing God in form, or Krishna, or Jesus, whatever it may be, you take that name. And when the mind has ceased its task of planning and execution, and at the first instance of wandering, you stop the mind and put it to work saying God's name. Because saying God's name, only one thought can be in the mind at a time, only one thought at a time, only that thought is in your mind, and therefore your attention is on God. How is our time going? Huh? Okay, all right. Now, since the control of the mind is extremely important in devotion, because in devotion you want to love God with all your heart all day long, He is love. You can merge with God only in love. You can't merge gasoline and water. You can merge water and water. And you can only merge in love with love. So Swami says to love God God with all your heart, all the time, washes away all the difficulties in life. So, then how to love God with this nuisance of a mind that we have? Not a nuisance because it's extremely important, but it engages in nuisance work. Swami tells the story, which you've probably heard before, but it won't matter perhaps to tell it again. The story of the king in India who um, was so distracted and so upset at the way his uh, kingdom was going that he dropped to his knees and touched the floor with his head and uh, prayed to God with all his heart. And so God appeared before him. And God said, well, uh, what do you want? And he said, oh, Lord, I need a good servant because my kingdom is going to the dogs. So God said, uh, all right, I will send you a servant. But I give you a warning too. If you allow him to be idle, he will destroy you. Well, that didn't register with the king because there was so much wrong with his kingdom that certainly the servant could never be out of work. So the servant came and started to work. And then one day, the king suddenly realized, good heavens, that servant is almost finished with all the jobs. He'll soon be free of work. Oh, then what's going to happen to me? He's going to destroy me. So he dropped to his knees again and prayed to God. God came again and said, well, what do you want this time? And the king said, oh, Lord, the servant you sent to me is almost finished his work. He's going to destroy me, Lord. What should I do? Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. So God said, very well. I'll help you once again. Now you do this. You build a brick wall 40 feet high. Made of bricks. 40 feet high. And when the servant comes to you to ask for more work, you put him to climbing up and down that wall. 40 feet up and 40 feet down, and 40 feet up, and 40 feet down, and you keep him busy at that work until you have another task for him to do. And that way, he can never destroy you. And Swami said that that wall is the name of God. And that servant is the mind. So therefore, you can keep the mind from wandering on all these destructive worldly paths it takes by as soon as you finish with your set work that you've given to the mind, you immediately replace the beginning of the random thinking with saying the name of God with all love. Now, with all love, with full realization 
of his omnipresence with you. A full realization that he is standing beside you and with you. Swami said that for the path of devotion, the essential thing is to choose personal God, to select personal God, and then learn to love that personal God with all your heart until your heart can bear no more love. And uh, when you love personal God so much, then you start to see him every place you look. Then you have realized universal God. Because we ask, God is every place at all times? How should we worship him in one form? <coughs> so I mean, says, you start that way. You start that way in the path of devotion. Not in the path of wisdom. We're talking about the path of devotion, which is the most important one. You start that way by thinking of him all the time. Right now, if you uh, become a bit weary of reciting his name, and when reciting his name, it's best to recite it to him. Now, for myself, the reciting of the name is a basic habit that I have. It took me a long time to learn it. It took me three years before it became comfortable. I heard Swami tell us to do that from the platform. And since I pay attention to what Swami says, I said, well then, he says, I must do it. I must do it. So therefore, I started to recite God's name. It wasn't in my line of work. I didn't like it. didn't feel good. I couldn't see any sense in it. But nevertheless, Swami said, do it. So I persisted day by day by day until after three years, it became natural. Now, Om Saram, Om Saram, Om Saram, repeats all the time in my heart and in my mind. All the time the name of God repeats itself. I am never not thinking of God. So then, therefore, when your mind starts to wander away into the mischief that it gets into, and then the bad conduct and the sequences that follow the trail of action and reaction. To stop that sequence, don't let the mind engage in its work of creating hatred and mischief and wrong behavior and so on. Keep it fixed on God. Now, another way to keep it fixed on God is to every task that you do, dedicate that task to God. You may want to uh, go out to the car. Maybe you thought you uh, forgot to lock it. And so you go out to the car and look at the car. Well, what's to prevent you from dedicating that action to God? Dearest Lord, I dedicate this action to thee. And then you go ahead and do the action in a way that pleases God. Do the action. Dedicate that action to God. Every ordinary action. Shaving in the morning, driving to work, going to the grocery store, doing your housework. What's to prevent you from dedicating it to God? Only your own forgetfulness, nothing else. Only your own lack of attention, nothing else. And you can easily overcome that if you have the interest, if you have the drive to become one with God, to be devoted to God, to love God all the time, to live in God's love. Very easy if you want to do that. Just take every ordinary action, dedicate it to God, and then do the action in a way that will please God. Then, Swami says, you are acting with wisdom all the time. If you're doubtful about the wisdom of what you're doing, consult conscience. Swami says that conscience is God in one's heart, in everyone's heart. Conscience is there. It is God. That's his residence in your heart. So therefore, if you're doubtful, check your conscience. If you feel uneasy about what you're going to do, well, don't do it. Think of something else. That's another way. And then, one of the very best ways, in my experience and in the experience of numberless other people, is to walk hand in hand with God. 
throughout the entire day. When you waken in the morning, there you are in your bed, and there's all this blank space in the bedroom. Swami's there. He's in that space. He is every place at all times. He is here in this room. He is standing behind each of you and standing beside each of you. I saw that to be true for three years running. After I'd been to India for four or five years, I came to America. And as I got off the airplane, I felt Swami's head and shoulders on mine. And I said, welcome to America, Swami. And then for three years, without exception, every place I looked, I saw Swami. In a meeting like this, I would see him wherever I look. I look at you, I see him behind, standing behind you. I see him standing behind you. I look over there, I see him standing against the wall. Every place I looked, for three years running, I saw Swami every place. So he is every place at all times, here in this room, this moment beside you at all times, whether you realize it or not, simply because the physical form is not there. He is there. He is not that physical form. He is the Lord, the divine omnipresent Lord. So therefore, when you awaken in the morning, if you really want to do away with ignorance and misery and delusion and enjoy the beauty and grace of being the Lord, then... Imagine Swami standing beside your bed. That's easy. All you have to do is visualize. Visualize his long hair. Visualize his features. Visualize his robe and his shoulders and his long robe. You may say, oh, I can't visualize. Nonsense. There isn't one woman here who cannot visualize the face of her mother. If so, let her stand. I would like to see her. Nor is there one man here who cannot visualize the car he's driving. <laughs> right? So therefore, visualizing is easy. You can easy visualize God standing beside you in the morning. Then when you arise, take his hand. Be with him all day long. If you're a bit shy... When you come to the bathroom, you can say, Dear Lord, wait for me. And pick up his hand again when you come outside. Walk with him on the street. Walk with him to the car. Be conscious of him. Be conscious of holding his hand. Be conscious of sitting beside him. And when you come to your work, then simply say, Dearest Lord, now I must go to work. Please excuse me. And Swami tells us that in your work then, concentrate 100% on your work. And at that point of concentration, there is God, just as much as he was with you when you were walking on the street and entering your office holding his hand. Now, there's another tremendous benefit to that practice of being always with God. You have no idea the benefit that you will derive until you undertake that and practice it and keep it going. You know, with apologies to Sam, we all of us have lots of bad traits running around in us. And normally we go to a psychiatrist to see if we can't get rid of those bad traits. And uh, good psychiatrists uh, have a tremendous help. But there's another way. And that way is walking hand in hand with God. All of these bad traits that we want to get rid of, hatred, jealousy, despair, depression, anger, impatience, or whatnot, all of those are flowers of the night, flowers of darkness. They grow in darkness. They grow in illusion. They cannot survive in the light of the Lord. So when you're walking hand in hand with Swami all day long, then you're enveloped in the light of the Lord. And these bad traits that upset you so much and make you so unhappy, gradually, you don't even notice them, gradually they disappear. 
gradually they completely disappear. So much so that you couldn't feel hatred if you tried with all your heart. I tell you that's so. The devotees, the great sages of the past tell us so. I tell you it's so from my own experience. The bad fates that I used to have, anger and so forth and so on. Walking hand in hand with God, they've simply disappeared without even my knowing they were going. They just don't stop existing. So you can change your entire life with your families, with yourself, with your community by walking hand in hand with God from the moment you get up until the moment that you go back to bed in the evening. Now, we all have desires. Life's impossible without desire. With no desire, there'd be no action. No action, no world. No world, no uh, play for God. So, action is necessary and desire is necessary. So what are you going to do about desire then? Swami gives three tests about desire. He says, is the desire going to hurt anybody? What I desire, what I desire to do, is that going to hurt anybody? If the answer is no, it's not going to hurt anybody. Go ahead. Next question, is this desire going to hurt me? If the answer is no, it's not going to hurt me. Then Swami says, go ahead. But he says, if the answer is yes to any of them, then cut them off at the root. Now you might think, how could the desire to enjoy, to be happy, be harmful? One time in Prasanthi Nilayam, there was a young lady there in a wheelchair. And she belonged, in those days, to what was called the International Jet Set. Many here are too young to remember about these pleasure seekers who used to jet all around the world for full enjoyment. A very real bunch of people at that time uh, got lots of publicity in the newspapers and the magazines. And uh, Swami said um, her trouble was she belonged to the jet set and too much happiness. She dived into a pool, struck the bottom, and uh, made some break along here in the spine and was confined to the wheelchair. So too much pleasure. It's just as bad as too much suffering. So, if we look at that which we desire to do in that way, will it hurt me? Well, is that going to be too much pleasure? That is, am I going to go on around to the nightclubs and with all the joy and drinking and fun and so on? I'm not going to hurt anybody else, but is it going to hurt me? Probably the answer is yes. Too much joy, too much pleasure. So cut it off and be finished with it. So in terms of devotion, then, the path of devotion, the most important path in spiritual life, the path of devotion, and it means merging with God. And we merge with God by thinking of him all the time, coming as close to him as we can, being with him all the time, he welcomes us. He knows that we are He, although we do not know that as yet. Don't be afraid of wearing out your welcome. Be with God all the time. And in respect to the path of devotion, there's really nothing further that can be said, as far as I know. So thank you for listening to me. This is your lucky day, because Jack's timing is so perfect, um, we have time for questions. So, this is your chance, if you'd like to ask Dr. Hislop a question. Agnes. Oh, tell the end of the foot story. Yes, Victoria went, agreed to go to India because of her foot. 
Well, first time we saw Swami that first day, she said, Swami, look at my foot. And Swami looked at it and said, don't worry, it'll be all right. And the course of the next six months, all by itself, it straightened out, became perfect. Just like that. The diamond. Swami uh, gave me this diamond um, about five birthdays ago. And uh, I had, he, he told me uh, we're in the veranda at Brindaven. And he said, um, come here, Hislop. And he said, uh, here, you need a ring. <laughs> so he just moved his hand. There is a ring. Very brilliant diamond ring. Then, of course, we have the uh, age-old famous eye ring, <laughs> the next portrait of the next ring. Let me, let me repeat the question so we get it. The, question, yeah. the, que the question has to do with other spiritual teachers, real and, or otherwise, uh, and whether it's harmful for Psy devotees to go to see them. You see, in response to that, Swami says that you have the right to investigate. You have uh, the right to test. If you're going to be endlessly naive and accept everything, how are you going to survive? You have to doubt. You have the right to test. You have the right to check. But Swami says that once you have finished your checking and have decided that the particular preceptor that you're interested in, is genuine, is, is real, and is genuine and real over a meaningful period of time, and you accept him as your preceptor, then it's a mistake to change. Then you should stay and dig deep. When you go from one to one, it's like being in a field, a farmer in a field wanting to dig for water. He goes and digs a, a hole three foot deep, no water. He goes to another place, digs four foot deep and no water. Another place five foot deep in no water. Finally, he keeps digging until he strikes water. But by that time, he's ruined his field. So don't be flitting about like that. Make a sincere investigation of the other gurus in whom you're interested in. Then make up your mind or postpone for the next life. You can do that too. Okay. What if you dedicate your life to Swami and he takes it in a... The actions. Do you want to repeat the question to the people? If the, <laughs> I'm going to make sure I got it. Uh, if you dedicate any given action in the day to God and also the results of that action, and as it unfolds, you become aware that the results are not quite what you had hoped, what, you sh what, sh what attitude should you take toward that? Okay. <clears throat> Any uh, action that uh, one takes, he plans it out carefully, and he counts on a successful conclusion to that carefully planned action. But we all know that successful conclusions don't invariably follow good intentions. They simply don't. In other words, there are factors in this equation that are other than me. I make up my mind, I make my plans, I put in my energy, but that's not all there is to it. There are other factors in there that may change the outcome completely. What is that other factor? That other factor is God or karma or destiny, whichever way you want to call it. It may well be that uh, destiny, uh, your destiny is, that that uh, endeavor will not uh, come about successfully. So therefore, if we recognize that, but every endeavor is not going to turn out exactly the way we want it. It simply won't do it. Try it and try it and try it and you'll find it doesn't work. So then, what should be our action? See, part of full devotion to Swami means um, surrendering one's life to Swami. That is, you say, Swami, you are the only reality. I also am God, but my idea of myself is just illusion. 
John Hislop, a human person, born and dying, and going through certain experiences. That is just a dream. Just a dream of karma, just as a sleeping dream. No different. So therefore, I have to say to Swami, Swami, I devote myself to you. You are God. Nothing else exists. Therefore, whatever happens must be your doing. You are at every place. I surrender everything to you, O Lord. I accept whatever comes as your will, O Lord. Now, so you accept whatever comes as God's will. And then what do you do? What comes is not satisfactory to you. It's not what you wanted. Then you use common sense. Swami says, what comes first? Common sense comes first. Spiritual sense comes next. So therefore, you find yourself in a dilemma because your project didn't turn out as you wanted it to. So now what are you going to do? Well, now you look at the project all new, again apply common sense, dedicate it to Swami, and again do the best action you can. All you're required to do is do sincerely and with energy the best action that you can, following common sense and following devotion to Swami. All the rest leave to him. Surrender to him. We have time for one more. Dennis? I'd like to elaborate on Richard's question of meditation. <laughs> okay. That's pretty elaborate. Do you want to take that on? <laughs> Go ahead, yeah. No, I'll no, take it on, uh, sure. Uh, um, <laughs> this, is not, this is not a question. I mean, I think there's a hidden agenda here. I think this is about people who consider themselves Psi devotees, people who are long-term Psi devotees, who are not questioning who Sai Baba is in their lives, but they find themselves attracted to another personality. And so what to, all right. What to, what to do? What do you think? What do I think about that? <laughs> you see, first of all, Swami tells us this. He says that See this hand. It can turn dust into gold. It can turn heaven into earth. But it cannot turn a man's heart to God. That's left for man. After all, man is God. So therefore, if people have come to Swami and do not wish to stay there and dig deep, deep, deep until they find the treasure far below, then they're at perfect liberty to go and test other water holes, other mines. Swami can't do anything about that. When a person decides to go their own way, I've seen it a number of times amongst uh, devotees in India. European and American devotees there. They get that idea, and Swami lets them go, doesn't say a word. He lets them go their own way and never interferes. And they wander away and never come back eventually. Thank you so much. Well,